Okay, down in, I'm in Genesis 37, and we're going to start at, um, uh, well, it, it, we got, um, let me see here, 36. Okay, what we have here is in verse 27, Genesis 37, 27, it says, Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brothers listened. 28, then Midianite traders passed by who are sons of Ishmael, okay? So the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. Now if you go down to verse 36, it says, now the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. Well, in verse 36, the Hebrew doesn't say Midianites. It says Medanites, which are a different group of people based on the account we're reading right now. And she bore him Zimran, Yakshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Why they chose in almost every translation to translate Medanites, Midianites, when the original says Medianites, I don't know. Maybe it's because they don't want people to get confused reading Midianites here and the Medianites down here and saying, well, there's a contradiction in the Bible. But they are promoting that by translating it differently. I don't know why translators chose to do that, but they did. But the word is actually Medianites the second time and Midianites the first time. I don't mean to confuse you with that, but it's just one of those things that when I see things like that, I always wonder, what are you thinking? Because you are translating the Word of God differently than it reads. Let it fall where it falls. Don't try to hide things from people. And there is a reason why it says what it says. But I just don't understand why translators do that, including the King James Version. Anyway, enough of that. But I just want you to know that there is a difference between Medianites and Midianites. All right. Then verse 3, it says, Yakshan begot Sheba and Dedan. We're going to see all of these names again elsewhere in the Bible. We're in verse 3, 25-3. Um, and the sons of Dedan were Ashurim, Letushim, and Leumim. Okay? And the sons of Midianite were Ephah, Ephor, Hanach, Ab Abida, and Elda'ah. All these were the children of Keturah. They are specifically mentioned in here because later they have a bearing on the people of Israel. Otherwise, you just say that, they, you know, Keturah had children and that was that. But we will see these names again in the account in uh, uh, later in the books of Moses or maybe in Chronicles or something. Anyway, that's why they're listed in here. And Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. All right, so Isaac is the son of promise. He gets everything. But Abraham gave gifts to the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had. And while he was still living, he sent them eastward away from Isaac, his son, to the country of the east. He knows that Isaac is the son of promise. He's been told that. And so he is keeping that line pure, and despite him having concubines and all kinds of girlfriends and all kinds of children, he's making sure that they are not going to infiltrate the family line of Isaac. So he sends them off to the east, okay? Um, this is the sum of the years of Abraham's life which he lived, 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died a good old age, a man full of years, and was gathered to his people. I love that terminology. I don't know about you, but when it says he's gathered to his people, I just, I, I love that. You'll see that with uh, Moses. You'll see it with other people as well. I just like the way that says. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite. So he is buried in the same cave as Sarah was buried, which he had purchased. And we went through that long account a few minutes ago. But uh, anyway, Ishmael shows up here. He was living off to the east somewhere, but he shows up, and he has not been an important part of the account, and so he hasn't been mentioned. That's all there is to it. Now, it, you would find the Muslims disagreeing with that, that he's the most important part of the account, because they go through Ishmael, they uh, trace their heritage to Abraham, and so Ishmael is the big son of promise and all that, but that's not the case. The Bible refutes that. The Bible is older, and uh, you know what? I... I I, I, I'm going to get this wrong. I didn't read the article, but I read a article on Drudge, the the um, you know the headline, and it said something about Muslims wanting to. And I don't know if it was in America. I don't know if it was overseas. I don't know where. But they are suing to have the Bible removed because in Pakistan. It, it's in Pakistan because the Bible says things like Jesus is the Son of God and this and that. Well, they claim all of these people that we're talking about in the line down to Jesus, they claim them as their prophets. But they say that the account 
is skewed and it, it does disservice because it says like bad things about King David. King David did this and it was a bad thing and it says bad things about Abraham. It shows the human faults and weaknesses. And they say, we want the Bible banned because it shows things that are unfavorable about our prophets, our line of the prophets. Well, guess what? They wouldn't even have a line of the prophets unless they had the Bible, right? And they're, <laughs> excuse me, they are taking their thoughts about God from a document that happened thousands and thousands of years later. 630 AD or something is when Muhammad wrote the, uh, supposedly received the, uh, the Quran. And they're basing all of their hopes on that rather than on the more ancient and obviously more reliable text, which is this. We've got proof of this text in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We've got it in all of the, you know, history, the Septuagint and all of these other documents. And it's the same thing as Mormonism when Joseph Smith says, well, I found another gospel of Jesus Christ. And people are putting their hopes in it when we have a sure foundation already. I don't understand the thinking, but yes. Weren't they upset because of the dim light cast on the line that became the Arab people? That's right. I mean, in the... Yeah, it, 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 it diminishes the prophets and it also diminishes the, the Ishmael and the line that became the Arabic people. When in fact, it's just God working through redemptive history in the way that he has chosen. As I said last night, we don't choose the way to salvation. We simply accept it or reject it. And God doesn't interfere with that. We can walk through the one door or we can take the broad road off to destruction. God is not going to make up our minds for us. But when we make up our mind, that's all there is to it. And so we need to make sure that we're right. If Islam is right, you know, if you're not sure, you better read the, the Quran and you better check it out. If you're fully convinced that this is right, why bother? But if you have a nagging doubt that maybe Muslims are right, go read the Quran. Check your theology out because you are responsible. And if we're completely wrong sitting here wasting our time every Monday morning, then, you know, maybe we should go blow ourselves up and kill a bunch of other people in the process. You, you want to make sure that you don't just dismiss things without thinking them through. Personally, I'll save you the time. I've read the Quran and I don't believe it's true. You know, you can take my word on it or not, but uh, I, I read it and I didn't get any inspiration out of it at all. But when I read this book, I feel inspired by God. And we, we need to be careful about feelings, though, because Mormons base all of their, their feelings, it, they call it the burning in the bosom. If you have that burning in the bosom, then you're following the right path. Well, guess what? It may be a bad chili pepper. I mean, you don't know. But that is what they, they actually rely on the burning in the bosom to know if their doctrine is sound or not. If you get the burning in the bosom hearing the, the, the Book of Mormon, then you're being converted. God is speaking to you through that. So, you know what? How do you know it's not the devil? You know, I mean, I, you, you have to use reason along with your faith. All right? They don't work separately. They work together. But there is a point where faith has to be exercised apart from reason. I don't know. I, I've given you the example a couple times. I'll give it again of, uh, in case one of you wasn't in here, the... Uh, uh, Sean Connery, um, the Indiana Raiders Jones. of the Lock Ark, the Indiana Jones movie. The second one, have you all heard that one? Yeah. You've all heard that parallel that I gave? Okay, well, I won't worry about it then. But, uh, yeah, it's, there's a final leap of faith that you have to make. But use your reason up until the point where you make the leap of faith. Very important. All right, so anyway, where were we? We were in... Uh, they buried him in the field, and then verse 11 it says, And it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac. And Isaac dwelt at Beer Lahai Roy, which is the well of the one who sees. Okay, Isaac is receiving the same blessing to you and to your seed. He's made this blessing. It's Isaac, not Ishmael, that's getting the blessing. Okay, yes, Ishmael got a certain promise as well, but it's not the covenant promise that leads to the Messiah, okay? So, now this is the genealogy or the generations of Ishmael. So we're going to throw this in here, the generations of Ishmael. And as I said, that word is toledot. And I, I told you, you can spell toledot in Hebrew like seven different ways. And the way at the very beginning of the Bible has two letters of vav in there, toledot. It says it twice. And the vav is the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the number of man. All the way from the time of Gen the, uh, the early account in Adam, all the way down to King David, it's never spelled with two vavs again until the time of King David, and it's spelled differently as well in the account of Ishmael, meaning that something is lacking in the account of Ishmael. All right, as far as God's um, 
working in human history. But anyway, we're going to uh, uh, put in here the account of Ishmael. Why are we going to do that? Because these people still have a bearing on the covenant people. And that's why he's including in that. As I said, you, you get these, these trees and it comes out like this and then it gets a little more specific and then it goes out like this and then it gets specific again and God is showing these people are affecting the line of the Messiah but they are not in the line of the Messiah. But there's one line that leads all the way down from Adam all the way to Jesus and that is the important line. All the rest of these just have a bearing on that particular line. All right, so... Um, this is the genealogy of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's maidservant, bore to Abraham. And these were the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names, according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael, Nebaioth, then Kedar, Ab Adbiel, Mibsem, uh, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadar, Tima, Yatur, Nafish, and Kedima. These were the sons of Ishmael, and these were their last names. Twelve sons, by the way, um, by their towns and their settlements. Twelve, oh, it says right there, twelve princes according to their nations. All right. These were the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years, and he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. Okay, so he's done. Ishmael's done. We don't need to know any more about him. He may be mentioned again elsewhere in the Bible, but that's the end of Ishmael. But the sons are mentioned because they will have a bearing on the people of Israel. Okay. Having said that, who else was 137 years old when they died? Okay, I think Sarah was. Did I say 137 or 127? Okay, Isaac will be 137 when he dies. I'm sure of that. So, uh, Abraham was 175. But when Isaac dies, I am sure that he is going to be 137 years old. And one other person, I believe, will be as well. So, um, uh, let me see, Laban. Anyway, Isaac... Let me see if I can find... Oh, yeah, now the days of... I know Isaac was 180 years old, and then we're going to get... It may be uh, Joseph or Jacob. One of these guys is... Hang on real quickly. I just want to get this for you because I know there's another person that's 137 years old and uh, 147 for Jacob. And then we have finally at the end of uh, Genesis... Uh, uh, Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph was 110 years old. Okay, that's not correct. Somebody was 137. I'm going to find it and uh, I'll let you know. But anyway, Ishmael was, Ishmael was 137 and he died. And those were the, life, uh, the years of his life. Okay, 18. They dwelt from Havilah as far as Shur. Okay, you've seen that term before. You're going to see it again in the Bible as far as uh, which is uh, east of Egypt as you go towards Assyria. So he's saying they're living in all this area Havilah from Shur, which is also the area which is going to be mentioned again. Um, and uh, anyway, I, we'll get into that right now. But um, uh, he died in the presence of all of his brethren. Now, there is a note on this one. I want to see what it says. He fell. Okay, never mind. 19. This is a genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old. There you go. 40 years old when he took Rebekah's wife. The daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. Okay, here we go. This is the next one. And I, I, we went through this before that every time somebody is barren, barren and having a problem, we're going to bring them up. Who else has been, been barren in the past and had a problem? Sarah. Sarah. Sarah, okay, and so the pattern is going to continue down. This is the second person with that pattern, and we're going to see um, the next one. Who is the next one that is going to be barren? And have, what's that? Elizabeth? No. Well, that she is. Rachel will be the next one. Rachel, the wife of uh, Jacob, okay, and then Elizabeth will also. Samson's mother, who's not named, but the father Manoah is named, is uh, Samuel's mother, um, uh, Hannah has a problem bearing children. So again and again and again, you're going to see that they are barren, not bearing children, and this is God's sovereign choice to allow that until he is ready for the person to have a child. You can see God's hand all over this in these accounts. All right, so um, Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. All right, so when uh, Isaac prayed, God intervened, he accepted it, and uh, that was that. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If all is well, why am I like this? They're struggling inside of her womb. So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. 
Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Once again, this is another pattern. We have the barren women. We have the other pattern, which is the younger serving the older, or the second replacing the first. Let's go back and who were some of the second who replaced the first? 